All right, today we're back on the step side project and we're gonna be taking care of four or five of the most common problems that I have seen on the inside of a GMT 800 Chevy truck. That's your 9907 body style and this will cover Chevy pickups, GMC pickups, and some of this stuff will even apply to the Escalades, Denali's, you know, Suburbans, Tahoe's, and pretty much anything GM full size of that era. My name's LT, and on this channel, we build custom and high-performance trucks, and if that content does appeal to you, if you think that sounds cool, help me out and hit that subscribe button because we are trying to reach 100,000 subs by the end of this year. Also, one more thing I haven't mentioned in quite a long time, actually, is we do have our own merch website up and running. It's tolmanperformance.com. Um, so anything you buy there will help support the channel. One of my personal favorites is this t-shirt that I am wearing right now. It's actually based on the actual Tolman family crest, but we did have it kind of tweaked a little bit to give it a cool gearhead theme. And anything you do buy on there helps support this channel, helps buy new parts like the torque converter I just ordered for the ugly truck. That's right, uh, the 2000, the other 2000 Silverado, the one we're not working on today, with the 8.1 turbo and the 4L80. We took it to the drag strip recently and it was just super, super slow off the line. So I ordered a new converter to fix that and hopefully, and I'm pretty sure definitely, it's gonna make it a lot quicker off the line and maybe it'll even give it some traction problems, which is not something that you want when you're going faster, but it's actually kind of cool to be able to roll into it and just blitz the tires. So. We got to wait like two to three weeks for that to come in, but I just placed the order this morning and I was really excited. So I wanted to share that with you guys. But anyway, on to the other 2000 silver out of the step side project. Let me show you what I've been working on. And actually the first problem that I fixed and it had to do with the monsoon that we just had pass through the area. So when I did pick up the truck, you guys probably remember the passenger side window was left open. It was like just halfway. The inside of the truck was filthy and I couldn't figure out for the life of me why they would have left the window open. Um, luckily it doesn't rain here all that often, but as it turns out, when it does rain, the inside of the truck, it gets soaked. And that's notwithstanding the window having been left open before. I'm pretty sure they left the window open to just kind of help it dry out. And the first thing that I noticed was up here in the passenger footwell, the carpet just started to get a little bit of, you know, moisture on the top. So I've got it just pulled back. I got a board under here just to let it sort of air dry. But when I started poking around, I realized the floorboard was wet and I thought it would be coming from up here. But luckily this is like rubber with foam on the back. This was all dry on the backside, which told me the water was not coming from the front, but it was coming from somewhere else. So I followed the water back and it was soaked in this little channel here. And the majority of the water was collecting in this back corner of the cab right here. There's like three quarters of an inch of standing water there. And when I drove the truck and hit the brakes, it would just kind of slosh ahead and it would just soak the front footwell up here. So the first thing that I noticed is that we had water dripping down the inside of this pinch weld right here. Not from the urethane seal that goes between the glass and the body, but rather actually between the two layers of metal. So as it turns out, the third brake light right up there, that's the cause of the leak. There's like a foam, uh, like a foam gasket that seals the brake light to the cab. And that foam breaks down over time. So basically it lets water in and it just kind of rides that channel right here on the top of the pinch weld and it runs down here. And then it actually went in between the two layers and that's how it sort of got in right here, dripped down. I have cleaned this all up, but there's a bunch of drips that went down here, collected right there on the floor. So I took it apart. I sealed up the third brake light just with some clear silicone, cleaned it really well, glued it back in, and I water tested it. And I have no more water coming from up there, but I still did get a little bit of water coming from these cab vents right here on the bottom. Now these are basically just little flappers or whatever and whenever you slam the doors it just lets the air pressure out and you can kind of see them through the gap right there on the back of the cab. Um, there's a, another similar foam seal that prevents moisture from getting in normally but once again uh, that seal had broken and there was some drips coming from right down here and adding a little bit to this right here. Now, this wasn't as big of a leak as the third brake light, but it still did contribute, so I popped it out. You can actually get your hand up underneath between the bed and the cab, just enough to reach it, and then you can take your other hand and kind of grab it in here to pull it in and out. So I added some more clear silicone on that, and I have these uh, one nickel and one penny just to kind of help push out this little plastic retainer. One of these did break there, but I still got three of the retainers. There's one on top. 
If these aren't broken, it just kind of helps the little plastic stay out until the glue dries. So that should be sealed up. I did both sides. And now I'll give it one more water test. And as soon as this all, you know, this jute backing or whatever dries up, which I think we're pretty darn close, we can put the interior back together. So water leaks are definitely no fun to track down and fix, but it's one of those things, if you don't take care of it, it will come back to bite you later on because you'll get mold and mildew and all sorts of other nasty smells coming from up underneath the carpet. So uh, fix the leaks, just peel back the carpet, let everything dry out and move on with your life. It's no fun to take care of these things that we're doing today, but it makes the truck a whole lot more enjoyable to drive. And that's what I'm all about is before I modify something, I've got to take care of the basics just for peace of mind, if nothing else. Uh, the rest of the things that we're going to take care of today, basically we've got this few, this little pile of parts right here. We've got an antenna mast because these break off all the time. We've got this little guy, which is an ambient light sensor that goes on the dashboard. And when this fails, your lights, your headlights will stay on all the time. It won't let the DRLs do what they should do. And then finally, these little spacers right here, and we get these bolts. I don't know what these do yet, but these spacers are what is going to fix the problem we have with the seat clunking back and forth. I showed you this whenever we took the first test drive of the truck, but basically there's a spot in the power adjusters that wears out. I think there's normally like a spring or something in there, but anyhow, it falls apart. And whenever you hit the brakes, the seat clunks ahead. And when you hit the gas, the seat clunks towards the back. Really, really annoying, really frustrating. So that's gonna be the thing that we take care of today first, because it does take a little while. You're gonna take the seats out of the truck, take the tracks apart, and then take the little adjuster apart, and then you can actually replace those washers there. So let's get started by unbolting the seat. So getting the seat out of these is very, very straightforward. There's two different sizes. This one on the back, there's two bolts. This is an E, I believe, E14 right there. That's an external Torx. The front ones are a little bit bigger. Um, I didn't have a wrench or a socket exactly this size, but a 12.15 millimeter works perfectly on those. Doesn't strip it out or anything like that. So uh, 15, 12 point on the front. E14 on the back. Um, there's one plug right here you have to undo. This is what sends power up to the seats. Um, you always want to vacuum under here because there's going to be a bunch of trash and garbage and pet hair. 
But on this one, I'm not quite sure what was going on here. It's almost like somebody spilled a gallon of vegetable oil or something because like, it's definitely not water. I mean, I did have the leak, but this is like some kind of weird oil and it's like soaked into this jute padding. It doesn't smell, but like when you take your hand and you press it on it, it just feels like, like I said, vegetable oil or something like that. So I cleaned up as much as I could. I don't think it's really going to dry any, but uh, we'll leave this up just a little bit while longer while we finish the repair. Um, so that's the seat comes out really easy. Now, in terms of the noise in the seat track itself, I got the one adjuster pulled out and it's really, really easy to see where the noise is coming from. So. Uh, to get the adjusters out, there are two bolts right here. Once again, these are an E, and the size is uh, E10 for that, external torque 10. Two of those, there's one here. This was an E12 with a 15 millimeter nut on the back side. You just kind of have to adjust this rail back and forth to get the little screw adjuster mechanism out of the way. And this right here is where the noise is coming from. So this block right here is threaded into this guy. Um, there's a little square drive right here and that connects to this little motor and there's like a you can kind of see here there's like this little 90 degree gear drive this is one of those like flexible speedometer cable type deals that right there engages into the nose of that and it turns and that's what adjusts the seats anyhow there's normally like a little spring spacer or something in there and that's what takes up all the slack and as you can see it just kind of wiggles back and forth and that is the cause of the noise so we're going to unscrew this clean it up put the spacers in, and put it back together uh, they do say you're supposed to like count the turns to make sure you get this kind of lined up in the same exact position as it was before just so that both the left and the right side of the tracks kind of are timed together at the same time so like i said that's next clean this up put it back together Alrighty, so the kit for the seat is from Dorman. That's the part number right there. I will link it in the description for you guys. It actually comes with two seats worth of spacers, and I do have to do 
the passenger side because that one is loose as well. Um, it also comes with these two bolts right here. There is a stud that they tell you you can kind of pound out to make getting the track easier. But I found if you just kind of slide the seat track to the back, you can get the adjusting mechanism out so you don't have to do any sort of pounding or anything like that. Uh, the install went fairly straightforward. And just to give you guys kind of like a before and after, uh, passenger seat right here, you can kind of see down at the bottom there. Still really, really loose. I need to do that one next. Um, but the driver's side, I've got it all in. It's really, really nice and tight. It's not going anywhere. The only movement in the seat is the like the recline spot. It's got a little bit of wiggle. But down below there, nice and tight, not going anywhere. And just to kind of double check everything, make sure the adjust works nice and smoothly. So the seats are done. That's one major annoyance checked off the list. I think the next thing that I'm going to take care of is on the radio. Uh, there is one more thing I'm not going to show you, or I am going to show you in this video. I already fixed it, but um, <clears throat> this is a stock radio. Stock radios aren't that great, but these little knobs were kind of broken. Uh, Amazon actually sells replacement knobs for this, and the volume knob and the tuning knob were like super sticky and nasty. So I had bought a whole kit that has the seven knobs, volume tuning, and the four balance fade and bass and treble. So that was pretty cool. But anyway, the next thing that I'm going to take care of is fixing the antenna for the radio. All right, so this is the stock antenna base right here. Uh, they actually redesigned these a little bit later on in the truck's production run because that little stud right, come on, focus, 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 right there. Uh, that little stud that's broken off, that was kind of undersized and probably doesn't help when people run these things through, you know, power car washes and all that. But anyway, um, this is the updated version. I already screwed the adapter on. This is because I'm using an aftermarket antenna instead of just like a stock antenna like I have in my other truck. I'll admit the adapter I got from Amazon is not the best fit, but it does screw down there and it's definitely not going to come off. And then this is what the antenna screws onto right there. Uh, anyhow, you don't necessarily have to take the entire cable out from underneath the dash. Um, you can see what I did here is I tied a string on one end just to kind of help me fish the new cable back in. It really wasn't all that bad, but if you don't want to have to deal with it, you actually can pull this cable out of the base. I tried this on the ugly truck and it actually just kind of disintegrated because this was old, but let me give this one a shot. You do kind of have to yank on it pretty good. And as you can see, if it'll focus, you probably could jam that into the new antenna, but to me, I would just much rather replace the whole thing because that's kind of how they intended it rather than reusing that guy there. Although if you wanted, like I said, it probably would work out. You'd probably get okay reception. I'm just kind of looking at it there. The little middle part of the coax is pretty fragile. So anyway, um, we're just gonna replace it with an all new one. And I think this is like $16, so why not? Like I said, adapter for aftermarket antenna. Um, the routing that you've got to take, I'll show you really quick. It's kind of difficult to get to, especially if you're right-handed. Um, but there's a little cavity right between the fender and the uh, firewall there. You kind of reach your hand down in there. There's a hole that's just off to the side. And then the antenna cable passes down through. You can kind of see where my little white string comes out. That's what I'm going to use to pull the antenna back in. But the other end of it sits right up there that's kind of just hanging out on top of the glove box anyway uh, so we'll just tape it back to the string pull it through connect it and we will be good to go
I've got the radio antenna base completely replaced. It's plugged back in underneath the dashboard. I did a quick check and I get more radio stations than I did before, which is great. Um, so we're good to go. I probably will replace the radio with maybe like a CarPlay one or something a little bit fancier in the future. But for now, at least we have a working antenna and this will obviously work with a stock or an aftermarket radio. So it's definitely a worthwhile upgrade. Now running the cable, the string actually didn't do me a whole lot of good because it ended up breaking. Um, whenever you have to fish the cable through the side of the firewall there, the heater box is like an inch away. So there's only just a tiny bit of free space and the cable comes in and it has to do a sharp bend up um, and the string just wouldn't kind of pull it through there. So I basically had my hand underneath the, on the hood side, just kind of, and I was able to push it through. Not a big deal. And then from there, I was able to have my left hand reaching up on the underside of the dash between the heater box and the side of the cab. And I was able to reach it pretty easily the rest of the way. The major struggle that I did have though was actually getting the rubber grommet to seal back in the hole. And I actually don't think I've got it fully engaged. So in the future, I'm probably gonna be pulling the fender off just to get that grommet clicked in, which is, it hasn't leaked so far. It actually, today is actually the next day and it did rain again last night and it hasn't leaked. And I also did check the ugly truck, the other 2000 Silverado, and that one is not leaking as well. But when I replaced that antenna base, I wasn't able to get it clicked in either. So I'm gonna be probably pulling two fenders off in the very near future, which does sound a little bit drastic, but it bugs me enough where I just wanna fix it. And to me, that's the only way to do it right is to actually pull the fender to get access to click that grommet in. Um, basically, it's just a little tapered shape there. There's a groove at the bottom. And I think the problem is when you push with your fingers like this, you're basically pushing the outside of the grommet down. You can't kind of push the inside. So that's the struggle I'm having. Uh, but anyway, at least the antenna is replaced and we have a radio reception again. So the very last thing we're gonna take care of today is the ambient light sensor. It mounts in the center of the dashboard and basically when it gets dark out, it turns your headlights on. And when it's sunny out, it's supposed to turn your headlights off. But whenever that ambient light sensor fails, it just defaults and it leaves your headlights in the on position all the time, which is sort of annoying. Now you can override that by pressing the dome override button by the headlight switch four times pretty rapidly. It'll just disable the automatic headlight control, but I'd rather have it working automatically how it should. This sensor, uh, I forget how much, I picked it up from Amazon like everything, and I will put links in the description below. Uh, that's the part number. I believe it's like 15 bucks. And in fact, everything that we're doing here today, the antenna, the radio knobs, that, everything's like 15 to 20 bucks. So it's inexpensive stuff but it just helps improve the truck driving experience. So uh, that is mounted in the center of the dash. And I'm pretty sure last time what I did, and I'll show you guys here again, is I just popped the radio out and I was able to access it through, uh, kind of through the center of the dash. And I know you can take the whole upper dashboard out and it makes it easier. That's the sensor right down there. It's just held in with like a little quarter turn type deal kind of like a bulb does um, so i think i'll end up pulling the headlight or the uh the radio out but i'm also going to just try from the top i'll give it a twist and see if i can pop it out and replace it just like that
So if you're going to replace the ambient light sensor through the opening with a radio, so if you're going to attempt to replace the ambient light sensor through the radio opening, you either have to have really, really teeny tiny hands or something like this nice little pick tool because this helps get the old sensor released and helps me install the new one. So to get it out, basically there's just one little tab right there. I was able to get the hook back there and just kind of release that tab, unplug the old sensor. And then when I'm plugging the new one back into place, I use this same hook to kind of hold the other side of the connector from pushing back. And then I was able to take my free hand and just kind of click it into place. And then once you do that, it's pretty easy to kind of finesse this thing back through the defrost vent thing, turn it up, put it through the hole and give it a quarter turn and lock it home. Um, like I said, about 15, 20 bucks. And we did give it a nice function test to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. I just threw the microfiber towel on there and in about 15 to 20 seconds, it flips the switch, the lights come on. And then when you take the towel away another 15 to 20 seconds later the lights turn back off just like they should and that's gonna wrap up what have been in my experience the five most common failure items on the inside of a GMT 800 99 to 07 Chevy and GMC pickup truck I have uh, probably three or four of these things now and I've pretty much done these jobs on all of them so I know they're common failure points and they're all inexpensive to fix luckily so we've got a total of five things today number one water leaks uh, third brake light and rear cab vents for this particular one but there's a few other places up on the cowling that can leak if you're trying to chase down a water leak you can look there as well uh, number two, we had the wiggling power seats. That's really, really simple to repair. It takes probably an hour per side. And that includes some time for, you know, vacuuming the carpet and cleaning the grease out of the old screws and re-lubricating everything. Uh, third and fourth are two things with the radio. Number one, the knobs, super simple to replace. That's not even worth showing you in a video, but it's just one little thing that kind of spruces up the inside of the truck. The antenna, that was definitely the biggest pain in the butt about this whole process because it's so difficult to reach your hand in there and get that grommet pushed through the hole in the firewall. Uh, but we have now all of our radio stations back again. And finally, the ambient light sensor, so our headlights do exactly what they should. And with those five things fixed, we kind of have the truck what, to where I would call a good stock baseline. I don't need to do any real repairs. Everything's functioning like it should. Everything works. And now we are ready to start modifying it. So what direction are we going to take with a step side build? First of all, drop a comment. Let me know once again what you would like to see. But I do have some parts on the way and some parts here already. In fact, this is going to be one of the first things that I install onto the step side. Those are actually stock torsion bar keys from a 2500 HD Silverado. I have them left over from when I did a leveling kit some time ago. Uh, I'm not going to tell you right now what those do, but most of you guys probably are aware. Uh, I have a few other parts that are showing up that are sort of associated with those keys. And then from there, I think the initial stage of this build, I'm going to do sort of like a budget minded daily driver build at first. You know, things like easy bolt ons, headers, full exhaust. I am going to do a custom exhaust build, but I'm going to try to stick to a budget somewhat. Uh, camshaft tuning, intake, just the basics, maybe a little bit higher stall converter, but we're not going to be swapping the engine, the transmission, re-gearing it. We're not going to be doing stuff like that at first. Once I kind of get a good baseline established and I get the ugly truck a little bit further along, we might eventually swap an engine, put a better transmission in and kind of do all that fun stuff. But for now, I'm trying to stick to a little bit of a budget. Um, so that's pretty much the plan for the build. We're at a good stock baseline now and we're ready to modify. I got to say thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it. Do me a favor though, click the subscribe button if you haven't yet so we can get to 100,000 subs. Click the like button, drop a comment down below, all the good YouTube stuff that helps the algorithm, helps this channel continue to grow, which I really appreciate all of you guys and your support so far. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you again in another few days.